and gentlemen, and thanks for tuning in to Seven Circles. My name is Jonathan. I will be your host today. On today's program, we have my older brother, Adam, Adam Spencer. Adam has been um, collecting and uh, investing in uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency for many years now. And I think that he's actually a really valuable asset to have on the program because, as you can tell, um, the monetary system is changing and it looks like uh, electronic currency is going to be the way. So, Adam, I want to say thank you for coming on the show. Um, it's good to have you here. Thanks for having me, bro. Absolutely. Uh, how you feeling today, man? Oh, I'm feeling just excellent, just excellent. Couldn't ask for a better day, man. All right. So you are in uh, Atlanta, right? Yeah, I'm actually in Atlanta, Georgia right now. East Coast, West Coast. Um, yesterday, uh, up in Santa Rosa, over here in California, they had some more forest fires. A lot of people got evacuated. Um, <clears throat> sky's, the sky's a little bit cloudy. Um, you know, it's been having a lot of forest fires up here this year, um, and it's been, you know, a really interesting year. What's things been like over there for you? Um, you know, things been good in Atlanta. It's been perfect weather. I mean, it's not too hot no more. It's cooled down a lot. Um, it's not really much going on. There's still people running around wearing masks, you know, scared of COVID and whatnot, but, um, yeah. No, I'm really sorry to hear about all the fires and everything going down San Francisco or, you know, where you at. But it's hard for me um, to believe that, you know, what you're saying about the sky, because I, I look behind you, the skyline looks just beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it is beautiful. Um, <laughs> you're a funny guy. All right, cool. So let's actually hop into this, man. Let's talk about um, um, Bitcoin. You know, <clears throat> as according like to what I know about Bitcoin, Bitcoin has been out since like 2009. Um, and um, uh, pretty much it, when it first came out, I think to buy one Bitcoin, it was probably something like, you know, maybe 25 cents. I could be wrong. But the price has increased dramatically. And now in order to buy one Bitcoin, it costs roughly around $10,000 and that price fluctuates. Um, it's definitely a, a big, big uh, asset. A lot of companies are investing in it, banks, uh, millionaires, billionaires, et cetera. I just kind of want you to give a little bit of history about it first. Oh, yeah. Um, Bitcoin, you know. It was basically created back in 2009 after our last recession. Uh, it was basically created because of all of the so-called quantum easing that the government is doing or the printing money. And um, there was a group of people, which we all believe it was a group, by the name of uh, Satoshi Yakamoti. Yakamoti, I know I just hacked up the name, but it's, it's basically a secret group. Some people think it's one guy, more or less, I believe it's a group. Some things a group of guys, but um, they basically wanted to stay anonymous. They create Bitcoin, and um, they basically gave it to the people. It's a decentralized um currency. So, That's at least what they create it as, but it's not. It's not actually a cur. It's not actually fast enough to be a currency. If you understand what I'm saying. Okay, so if I'm getting you right, um, so they actually don't know who created it. There's this 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 speculation going around whether if one guy created it or if it was a group that created it, correct? Yeah, absolutely right. Okay, and it was created during the last um um I guess you could say recession in in two thousand and nine. Yes. Yeah. Now, what are the, what what are the benefits of um uh, cryptocurrency? Why would somebody be interested in looking at something like that? Uh, one of the most unique things about um Bitcoin is because it's um a scarce as um asset. Um, but basically, you know, there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin in existence. So therefore, um, it, it's very, you know, it's very limited how many people will actually hold a whole Bitcoin. There's going to be a time in history that's going to come very soon, I believe, where people is not even going to measure how many Bitcoins you have anymore. They're going to measure it by how many Satoshis you own. Because it's going to be very rare for somebody to own the whole Bitcoin. Because right. you got to think about how many people in this world, and only they say about one to two percent actually owns Bitcoin at this time. So, so let's actually unpack that a little bit because you said a bunch there. So one thing you said is that there are only twenty-one million Bitcoins that have ever been created, correct? That that's ever going to be created. That's Bitcoin, in order to get Bitcoin, goes through a process which they call uh, mining which is a, a proof of work through the blockchain, which the blockchain actually is what 
allows Bitcoin to exist. That's what makes it so unique. Blockchain is just an elect electrical um, ledger, pretty much. Okay. Um, so, so, so 21 million that can only, uh, that's ever going to be created, and you can produce more and do a process called mining, correct? Yes. That is correct. And the mining, whoever mines it, is recorded on this new technology, which is called the blockchain. And the blockchain pretty much tells when the transaction was uh, taking place and it has specific dates, times, and the whole nine yards, correct? Yes, yes. And, more or less, yes. And, and now you said something else, as something called a Satoshi. And a Satoshi, what, what unit of measure is that? Is that a Satoshi is the, is the smallest unit that you can break um, a Bitcoin down to, such as a dollar can be broken down as into one cent. Right. A Bitcoin is, I think it's 18 million of a Bitcoin is one Satoshi. Okay. So I, I could be wrong, but I think it's 18 million Satoshi to make one Bitcoin. So therefore, like if you wanted to buy a Bitcoin, even though one Bitcoin um, is, you know, costs about 10 grand right now, you can actually buy, you know, $10 worth of Bitcoin if you want, which means just get a very small fraction of it. It'll okay. Be, you know, so, 0 0.00001 of a Bitcoin. You know? Right. Right. So, so that is some of the benefits of it. What, what are, what are other benefits of it? Well, one of the greatest benefits I think about Bitcoin is that it's decentralized. Decentralized means that it's not controlled by anybody. It's not controlled by no government. It's not controlled by, you know, one person or one company. So it can never be shut down. Since it was invented, now Bitcoin will exist forever. So, you know, the government cannot shut it down. Can The only thing they, they can do is they want to try to um, say it's illegal to own the Bitcoin, but can they really take the Bitcoin from you? The Bitcoin exists basically on the water in your computer. Um, it's not like you go buy a Bitcoin from a bank and then the bank holds it. There's such things called exchanges which they can hold your Bitcoin. But if you are going to invest in Bitcoin, I suggest you, um, you know, you put it into your own wallet, which there's different type of wallets. I'm not going to go into that right now, but you put in your own wallet. Therefore, you actually hold it. The government can't take it from you. They can't shut it down. The banks is, is actually basically an enemy of the bank. Even though the banks right now, because they feel that they're going to get left out and left behind in place, they're trying to find ways to involve themselves in this new revolution. So they're trying to become in a bank and saying they will hold your cryptocurrency for you, which I, I think that kind of defeats the whole purpose of having cryptocurrency, you know? Right. Well, one of the reasons it was invented is because of what the banks were doing by printing, you know, printing trillions and trillions of dollars, which is increasing the value of the dollar that so many people um, worked hard for and was holding. So every time they print, like every time the government prints more money, it's depreciating. Your, your, your savings is being depreciated. The, the power of the, the dollar is losing its value. So a dollar is no longer can do. A dollar tomorrow, today, will not be as valuable as a dollar in 10 years because they're printing so much of it. But Bitcoin, you cannot print it anymore. So that's why the value just keeps increasing. So, so to me, it kind of sounds like gold as far as the sense that it's um, decentralized. You know, you can have gold in South Africa, gold in um, England, gold in the U.S., gold in um, uh, what, Brazil, you know, Africa, any place, whatever. And gold is going to always be worth the same amount of money no matter where you go. And, um, you know, also in the sense that you said, that the government could ban it, such as, and I believe it was 1933, the government actually banned it uh, gold, where it was illegal to hold gold um, um, or gold uh, currency anywhere. I think jewelry was okay, um, but it was illegal for you to hold it in the USA. Um, yeah, yes, you're absolutely right. And um, a lot of people call Bitcoin liquid gold. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They call Bitcoin digital gold. Um, because, it, yes, it's, it's a, more or less, I don't look at it as a currency, it's more or less a store of value, just like gold. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of very similar attitudes. Um, but one thing about gold, the difference between, the biggest difference between I, I see in Bitcoin and gold is that Bitcoin can be, you can move it very easily. You can move it across borders. Gold, you cannot move across borders. 
So if you have a bunch of gold, you know, in, in one place in your house or somewhere, and you decide to go ahead and move to um to to China, to Arizona, to somewhere else, it's going to be very hard for you to take, you know, $3 million of gold across borders. Most countries don't want you to, it does not want you to leave the country with the gold, you know, so. Right, and, and I guess that's why a lot of people have, you know, I know a lot of people from India, they do things like purchase gold and uh, jewelry. That way you can have all your um, necklaces on and your earrings, et cetera. And that way you can kind of get it across. That, that's one way you can cross borders. You're absolutely right. But but in order to carry $3 million worth of gold, you have to be somebody who's extremely uh, strong, right? Uh, yes, gold is very, very heavy. That's very good. Okay. okay. Uh, so you, so you, you, you were saying, so it's, it's, de, it's decentralized, which is one good thing. There's only a certain amount. It's a scarce, um, uh, uh, it's a scarce asset, as you were saying. It's only going to be $21 million that's ever um, created. Um, and then in addition to that, um, you can buy it in increments such as Satoshis. So you don't need to buy one whole gigantic Bitcoin. And the reason that you're saying that it's important that people should consider looking at it or buying it because the dollar bill is constantly losing its value through a term called quantitative easing. And that's just the sense that the government is printing money. You know, as we can see right now with the, the bailouts and that's been going on since 2009. But the bailouts and um, uh, giving people money for unemployment and so on and so forth, that that's actually decreasing the value of the actual um, dollar. So to buy Bitcoin, it's like a safe haven. Am I correct? Yeah, yes. Many people, um, many people do look at it as a safe haven. Um, and it's very volatile right now. Bitcoin can go, you know, it can easily drop down to three thousand dollars. It can easily go to a hundred thousand dollars, and this can happen in a matter of months, a matter of years, really fast. Yeah. So, 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 if people do, if people call it safe haven, and yet it's so volatile, what wouldn't it be better just to have faith in the dollar, as the dollar has has been something that's been stable for a, a long time? You know, because it, one one day your dollar isn't worth, let's say three 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 pennies, and then the next day your dollar is worth um, ninety four cent or a dollar and twenty five. You know, it pretty much, yeah, you know, we're losing inflation. Um, based on inflation, every uh, year we lose about, uh, I think it's 2% inflation. So the dollar bill is constantly losing its value. But that, you know, 2% is a, it's not that much. It's a very small amount, you know, and you think about it in terms of Bitcoin or how volatile it is. So I could end up putting $100 into Bitcoin and purchase that much of it. And then let's just say next month, that $100 could be, could, could be worth, Thirty thirty dollars. Am I correct? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you are correct. Um, I highly doubt that Bitcoin is going to go down that much that fast. But you are absolutely right. And the whole thing is, you know, money is built off for of one um, key, which people realize it's all about faith. The reason the dollars worth the dollar is because we all have faith that the government say that the dollars worth the dollar. And right now, the dollar bill is actually the um, world's currency. That's the currency that every country uses to um, trade among each other. And slowly but fastly, um, countries and people are losing faith in the dollar because um, it, it's just so much of it out there now. They're just printing it like crazy. So once, once the value of the dollar um, go down, many experts saying that the dollar will crash very soon and the dollar will not be the world's currency for long. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but you know, every kingdom has a rise and a fall. And most, this is not the first time there's been a, a, a fiat currency that, that has ruled and ruled, has ruled the world before. Um, just for those who don't know what fiat currency is, a fiat um, currency is a currency created by the government that gives it value just because the government says it's valuable. Um, and on the average, that currency used to only last about a hundred years. And we are fastly coming to that point of that the American dollar has been around for, um, you know, I'm going on around hundred years and in real fall. Yeah, I think, I, I think it was, it was invented when the, um, uh, the Federal Reserve was invented, correct? That's when we uh, had, I don't, I'm not sure of that. Yeah, I, I, did, I did some research. I think it was invented, the first dollar bill was when the Federal Reserve was. But what, what, what is interesting is that our dollar bill 
used to be backed by gold, which is why I had a, a significant amount of value and things such as quantitative easing couldn't exist because um, you could only have so many dollars based on how much gold you actually had. So if you had 10 pounds of gold, you could only have 10 pounds or 10 pounds worth of dollars in circulation. So mm -hmm. since we don't have it backed by anything, we can have as much, um, as much dollars in circulation as we see fit, right? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, which we both know, and uh, I think it was 1971, President Nixon took the um, battle off the gold standard. And the reason he did that because uh, too much gold was um, leaving, leaving the country. There was too many, um, you know, outside the country, there was too many other countries that had um, American dollars and they were trading on American dollars for gold and they was taking all the gold out of the country. They figured that would depreciate the whole, you know, uh, uh, us as a world power, pretty much. You know, what, you know what's interesting? If you think about it, President Nixon, right? So he took the dollar off of the gold standard in 1971. If you do 1971 and you look at right now, it being 2020, that's been exactly 49 years. So the dollar bill has been off of the gold standard for 49 years. Now, if you take into account that the dollar loses 2% uh, uh, inflation every, every year, meaning that when it first started, the dollar was worth a dollar. Then the next year, it was worth 98 cents. The year after that, it was worth 96 cents. The year after that, it was worth 94 cents, so on and so forth. So right <coughs> now, after 49 years, our dollar bill is actually worth 2 cents, which yeah. means that in one more year, our dollar bill will officially be worthless. There will literally be nothing. Uh, it, it wouldn't really be worth anything whatsoever. And I think that's kind of ironic if you think about the times that we are in and how much we are actually printing it and how money is just being, you know, tossed around like money in a strip club. Um, you know, it's, it's really, really uh, uh, um, interesting and something to think about. So maybe, maybe you know, to diversify and to put uh, your, your dollars into something else like cryptocurrency, like gold, but we're speaking about Bitcoin, you know, uh, specifically that that would be a great alternative. I think it's an excellent alternative. A lot of people don't realize that it's such a small percentage of the world that's actually on Bitcoin at this time. So Bitcoin will grow dramatically. Like right now, Bitcoin is worth 10 grand. A lot of people, you know, saying that's a lot of money, but mark my words when I tell you you will look back one day and wish that you have bought some Bitcoin at 10 grand. Um, I, I see Bitcoin within the next 20 years being well over a million dollars. For, yeah. for, for one Bitcoin? For one Bitcoin. Okay. And it's just like I was telling you, it's going to be very rare for anybody to have, you know, uh, to own the whole Bitcoin. Anybody that owns with a 0.10% of, of a Bitcoin will be among the most, some of the wealthiest people on the plan. Hmm. So, you know, it, it, it reminds me of a story that I read about Bitcoin. I think this took place in 2009. It could have been 2010. And you can quote me if I'm wrong, but uh, there was a, a pizza shop. And I don't remember the name. It could have been Papa John's. Papa John's. Yeah. And, and, and they had a program on where you can actually purchase a pizza with Bitcoin. And for the pizza that they purchased, it was roughly around something of 80, uh, 80 Bitcoin. And it was 10,000 Bitcoin. 10,000 Bitcoin. And Bitcoin at that time was worth how much for Bitcoin? That was, that was a worth 10,000 Bitcoin. That was $20. That was, that was $20 at that time. And, and if you do the math right now, that, Bitcoin, that amount of Bitcoin would have been worth something about $10 million, $20 million. It was about $100 million a piece of Bitcoin. Does that say that among people who invest in, who's in the crypto world, they call it piece of day. It's the day where they, uh, you know, the first piece was actually bought with Bitcoin. That was the first purchase in, in history of Bitcoin that they really bought. You know, that's, that's 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 interesting. And that was and that was just back in 2009, 2010. That was you know roughly a decade ago. Yeah, Bitcoin's only 11 years. Uh, Bitcoin's only 11 years old. And within election 11 years, it has risen over nine million percent. It is the greatest performing asset of mankind to this day. Not many percent. That's a lot. And, and you know, I've been hearing a lot of speculation that, you know, in 2025, 2030, that 
the way that we do business right now, such as commerce, such as with money and things of that nature, that is going to be totally revolutionized and things are going to be extremely different uh, by the time we're in uh, 2025, 2030. What do you what, what do you think about that? I mean, you're actually right. I don't know if you're aware of it, but it's already um, it's already in the works. I mean, China already has a cryptocurrency that um, they have invented that they're going to make it mandatory for um, the, the whole, you know, everybody in China is going to have to use it. They're not giving people a choice no more. Um, America's actually, believe it or not, they're working on digital um, dollar. They're going to make, um, they're going to have a ban on cash, as I believe. It's not going to be a true ban. Basically, it's going to be illegal to sell anybody or for you to buy anything. I believe they're talking about five grand in cash. If you're buying something over five grand in cash, it has to be digital. You're going to have to use the digital dollar. But a lot of people don't realize the main reason countries are doing this, um, the same reason they do everything, is all about control. You know what I mean? They, if they control the um, money, they control the people. And by having people, you know, use digital currency, it's very easy to track. They can track everything you do with your money. They can track where every dollar is going. They can track how much taxes you owe them. They can track everything separate. It's hard to do that when you have paper currency. Right. You know, it, it's, it's interesting because I remember two years ago about um, um, uh, Sweden. And I found out that Sweden was a cashless society. If they actually, if you go to the bank, you know, you get your check cash, you don't get dollars in return. They just deposit the credits directly into your account. There really isn't any uh, much of a need going to the bank uh, in, in, in uh, Sweden anyway. And they have a new currency, but the currency is actually just hung up and it's more of like a, a artifact or like a um, decoration. It isn't something that is in um, use. Mm, excuse me. Like it, it isn't something that is in use. It doesn't go from hand to hand. Um, and that's been operating like that for a long time. And back to, in the two years ago, I was saying like, wow. You know, it seems like that this is just like the testing ground and eventually that's where the whole world is going to be going. And now, lo and behold, you know, right now you're saying that they're working on a digital currency right now. You know, I know change was really scarce because of the whole coronavirus. A lot of places were saying that they aren't accepting change. Uh, we just talked about how the dollar bill is pretty much uh, right now are worth about 2% um, of what it used to be our, our, um, as far as its uh, original value that is now worth uh, you know, two percent. That you know, we're in some interesting times, and maybe it is something that we should consider. Because what do we have to lose, really? And the thing is, we kind of have a lot to lose if we don't, um, if we don't, uh, you know, think about things in a different type of way. I mean, you're absolutely right. You, you gotta, you gotta be able to, um, which we both know, to be to be successful and to be a great investor. Or you don't want to have to be able to kind of predict and look towards the future. You got to move the trend. You, you can't try to live in the stone ages. You see what happened to many businesses that try to hold on to the old tradition. You look at Blockbuster. Blockbuster had a chance to um, buy out Redbox, but they refused to. And now they were not. You know, you you know speaking, speaking of Blockbuster, there is one Blockbuster left, and it's actually in... Um, What's the name of the state? The one next to uh, California, uh, Oregon. It's actually in Oregon. And what they have is they have a bid inside of the store and they have like a fridge and they have the videos and the cassettes, you know, the uh, VH1 uh, uh, tapes or whatever. And you can go to that Blockbuster and you can spend the night there, spend three days there. So it's kind of like a hotel and then you can watch any videos that you want to watch. But it's more now like a... Um, you know, something fun that something something fun that you would do, but it really isn't, you know, to you know, every Friday go get a blockbuster and go get a, a Pizza Hut or a Papa John's or something like that. Yeah. I mean I, I remember back in the days when we was kid. We used to go to the blockbusters and we were able to pick out a couple of movies. Right. That was good times, you know what I'm saying? But I and mean then it had and then it had that little room in the back, the room where it was the um adult section. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, I remember that. We used to Try to step back there and get quick peek. Let's go a little back there. Yeah, we get kicked out. Yeah, I remember those days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the same thing. Like, you look at um, places like Sears. Sears may be another because they don't have an internet, um, um, you know, they don't have an internet, an internet face. Like, it's a, 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 they don't have a website. They didn't move with the, you know, with, with the um, trade, with the right. trend. So, right. like, you look at Walmart. Walmart's done blew up. 
because they have an internet presence. But then you look at um, more, um then you look at um, Kmart. Kmart don't I don't even know they exist anymore. Yeah, you know, because I heard something about Walmart that Walmart is actually now they put all of their stuff online, so they're kind of in the, not in the same realm as Amazon, but they definitely do have some. Um, they do have their feet in the water. Oh yes, Walmart and Amazon—they are the two two largest um, stores, pretty much online. They have a very large online presence. I believe they probably sell just as much product as online as they do. You know, in stores. So, so pretty much, uh, Walmart they they looked ahead and they adjusted um, where they were going because they knew that if they could uh, continue on doing the same thing, that they were going to be in, in business because that wasn't the way that the, the flow was going. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You have to be able to move with you know the new stuff that's going on. So, so, so similarly, what you're saying is such as you know on an individual level such as people, you know, they need to look ahead and see what the banks are doing and what the countries are doing. And if the banks and countries are buying Bitcoin and things of that nature, then maybe it's something that they should be doing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's so many businesses out there that have been buying Bitcoin for, they've been buying Bitcoin for years and stacking, but they don't talk about it. Um, but there's a lot of people out there that talk bad about Bitcoin, but at the same time, they're in the background buying Bitcoin. You know, there's a lot of companies and investors out there that has large um, um, social influence that they'll try to say bad things to push the price of Bitcoin down just so they can buy at a cheaper price. Okay. So, 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 okay. So now that we kind of have a firm understanding of what Bitcoin is, uh, where it came from, you know, the, the history of it and how, you know, Bitcoin has became so big right now as far as how the value has increased. What about if somebody wanted to purchase Bitcoin? I mean, there are people in you know all walks of life. We got you know younger people, older people. Some people are tech savvy. Some people aren't. You know, is it as simple as going into the, uh, I don't know the bank or some um, exchange uh, place saying, "Hey, let me buy some Bitcoin." Like, how do you actually purchase a Bitcoin? What is the process? Within the last three years, it actually became very easy to purchase Bitcoin. You can easily go to different websites, um, there's crypto.com. Um, crypto.com? There's crypto.com, there's uh, Coinbase. Coinbase. Binance US, um, you know, there's Binance US Aid, then there's just Binance. There's several different places you can actually just go buy Bitcoin with your debit card online, very simple. Um, nowadays, Almost in every other gas station in Atlanta, you can walk in there and there's a Bitcoin machine in there where you can actually go right to the machine and buy Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I heard you were selling it in 7 Eleven now. Yes, yeah, so you can go up to the kind of 7 Eleven and CVS. And also, um, uh, Cash App, you can buy it through Cash App if I'm not wrong. I own Cash App. Um, PayPal is working on something right now. You can't buy it on PayPal yet, but within the next few months, um, you're gonna be able to buy on PayPal too. They're working on their whole cryptocurrency. It's, it's becoming um, it's becoming mainstream very fast. It's moving a lot faster than I actually thought it would. So um, so so if Seven Eleven, if CVS, if you know all these places are buying it, um, they know they might know something that that we don't that we don't know. Oh, they know <laughs> they do know something that most of the world don't know. Remember what I said? It's only two percent of the world that owns Bitcoin. So they, they're setting themselves up to be very great, powerful position when Bitcoin does become mainstream. Remember, the Bitcoin that they hold now say they might only hold two million dollars worth of Bitcoin. As soon as Bitcoin, you know, keeps climbing and hits a million dollars one time, they will help it have billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. Right. Okay. Um, oh, nice water. You got the same one as me. Kroger. Oh no! Cheers. <laughs> um, um, all right, so Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Okay, so um, we know where we can purchase it from. You use a debit card, you just can purchase it online the way that you, you can uh, purchase any other thing online. Like, um, And then once you purchase it, where do you put it? Because it's electronic. I mean, it literally doesn't exist, you know? Well, I mean, it does exist. Like, a lot of people think that you um, actually... You know, you can download an app on your phone. 
which is it's called a cryptocurrency wallet. You can download one on your computer. It's called so you crypto, it the, huh? cryptocurrency wallet. It, it's called a crypto wallet. It's, it's called it's, it's a cryptocurrency wallet. Okay. It's called a wallet. It's just an app that holds, keep track of your Bitcoin. So, so what's on your cryptocurrency? Just because I didn't explain this, I'm not going to go deep into it. But Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. It's just the one with the largest market cap. There's over 7,000 different cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin is not the only one. And it's not the only one. It's just the largest one. That's it's just the largest one. It's the one that has the most money invested in it. And it was the first one, correct? It was the first one, yes. It was the first one. The first one is always the best, you know? Yeah, the best is decentralized. A lot of these other cryptocurrencies are not decentralized. They're owned by different industries. Okay. Different corporations. So once you purchase it and then you put it in your wallet, correct? Yes, that's correct. In your wallet. And, and um, okay, so you purchase it, you put it in your wallet, and then when you want to spend it, um, how, do you, how do you go about that if you wanted to spend it? I mean, if you want to spend it, it depends. Some places, there's a lot of places, on, um, there's a lot of the app stores online that actually accept Bitcoin for purchases. Right. Um, I'd say the main reason, you know, the main thing about Bitcoin is very slow. So um, it depends how many people is using the network at the time. Um, if you go ahead and, you know, like you can send your Bitcoin from one, one wallet to another wallet, and it might take a 15-minute process. It might take an hour process. It depends on how busy the network is. Mm. So. That is kind of slow. But, and, but, and, so what, what you're saying also, too, is that now some banks are actually, can actually hold your cryptocurrency for you. Yeah, um, it's very, I mean, th there's a lot of, like, besides, besides crypto wallets, besides cryptocurrency wallets, there's cryptocurrency exchanges. It's basically where you go and you, and you can trade your cryptocurrencies for other cryptocurrencies. Right. A lot of people keep their um, cryptocurrencies on these exchanges, but you have a wallet that's on the exchange that's pretty much your wallet. But at the same time, you really... It, I, the way they say if your cryptocurrency is not in your wallet, you don't really own it. Just like when you have money in the bank, just in case you don't know, you don't really own that money. The right. bank the money. They allow to give you access to your money. Right. So it's the same thing with these um with these um exchanges online. But some of the most beautiful things about some of these exchanges online, there's very few out there, like uh Celsius is the one I deal with. Then you got one called Blockify, um, where you can put, store your cryptocurrency on there and you can earn a very nice interest. Like, you know, the banks holding your money, they, they don't pretty much pay you nothing for holding your money. But I can put my cryptocurrency on some of these exchanges and I can earn up to about 16% per year just by them holding my Bitcoin. So I think that's just wonderful. I mean, why save your money in the bank when they will pretty much charge you to hold your money with a cryptocurrency um, exchange will pay you to hold your currency. Right. So some, of the, some of the research that I did is that um, the, the banks that, um, that, that, that can hold your cryptocurrency for you, um, it's a little bit different than money because they won't be able to actually use your cryptocurrency as fractional banking, you know, and I, I'm sure you guys know how that, that works, you know, how right now we go by something called fractional um, banking in, in the U.S., where they can take a dollar and actually turn that dollar into, I believe, $10 and lend it out to certain uh, uh, places. Um, but they can't do that with your current, current cryptocurrency. You can't because you can't create more cryptocurrency. You can't, you can't create more. It's like, it's like gold, right? Yeah, it has its... A lot of people think it's not physical, but it's a number that cannot be copied. So you, you cannot make a copy of a cryptocurrency and try to sell it for more. You can't do it. Okay. Everything's recorded on a ledger, which is the bot blockchain, and it's public. So, so I mean, I know you're not like a financial advisor or anything like that, um, but uh, what, what do you think is a good amount of cryptocurrency to you know invest in, like as far as to have in your portfolio, like? Two percent, five percent. Like, what do you, what do you think about that? Me, I, I mean, I, I'm all in. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, my whole portfolio, portfolio is pretty much cryptocurrency. You know, um, I mean, I, I plan to buy some real estate. The only real estate I own right now is my own house. Um, but right, right now, cryptocurrency 
it, it's just such a fast way to, to grow your money that I can't look any other way. There's no, I've never seen an asset like it before in my life. Um, like a lot of people invest in stocks and, you know, when they earn 20, um, when they earn 10%, 20 cents per year, they think it's a great. I'm talking about, I have bought cryptocurrency and earned 100% within 24 hours. I mean, I can't turn away from that type of um, investment. But the whole thing is a very risky thing. Um, if you're going to spend your money in cryptocurrency, you got to be prepared to, to lose all that money, you know, just as well as you, you're prepared to make money. Because it's a, it's a roller coaster. So it's a dangerous wide ride, but it's a very rewarding ride if you, you know, do it right. Yeah. Mm. Okay, now if I'm not wrong, you did say you just purchased a uh, house not too long ago. I remember you telling me that you actually did use uh, some uh, cryptocurrency to purchase your house, correct? Yeah, there was some um, between me and my lender. There was some um, discrepancies about the money that I had in my bank and where it came from. Um, so, in order for me to um, be able to buy the house, I actually stole some of my Bitcoin to just to put down um, down payment. You know, which I still beat myself up about, about that to this day. I mean, I'm happy. I'm, I'm very blessed and happy that I have my house, but I will not want to sell my cryptocurrency. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, but like, I'm going to be honest, I only sold, I only needed like a thousand more dollars in my bank account just to make them happy. Right. So I only sold like a thousand dollars worth. But that thousand dollars right now would be worth three thousand. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. This is 300 percent, but right. you know, can't cry with still now. Right. Yeah. But you can't cry if you got a hole in your pocket and you keep putting money in it. Yeah, you keep pouring it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, that's when you start people start panicking. All right. So 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 since we're on the topics of like investing and things like that, you know, a lot of people say like, Oh, what was the ROI? You know, what was the return on investment on that? Well, yeah. you know, in my opinion that the best and the most thing that people should really invest in, the biggest asset ever is they should invest in themselves. Because if you don't invest in yourself, it doesn't matter how much gold you have, how much cryptocurrency you have, or whatever, you're not going to keep it, and it's not really going to mean much. Like, we see a lot of people who are, let's say, uh, strung out on drugs, or maybe they just have a poor uh, mindset, and then all of a sudden they win the lottery, or they come into a big amount of money through, you know, inheritance, or something like that. And then, you know, five years down the line, they end up, you know, being really, really broke, or in the worst position than they were uh, before they even came in contact with the money. Uh, what do you what do you think about like um, personal development and investing in yourself? What were some key books uh, for you that has actually helped you along the uh, journey? I mean, yeah, I mean, I agree with you 100. percent It's I've been on a long journey of um, you know to become wealthy, and it, it took me a, a long time. It took me a long time to get here. And my main mistake was because I was too busy trying to make money instead of trying to better myself and, and train me uh, my mind. All the funding to, to build wealth, I had to I had to change my train of thought completely. I had to think different. I had to look at everything different. Um, you know, I, I was raised in the school system where they do not teach you about money. They do not teach you how to invest. They do not teach you the value of dollar, how to have your money work for you to make more money. Oh. You know? So that was a big learn, learning curve. And um, basically, the the main book that that really turned, that made me look at everything different was um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. It basically taught me about assets and liabilities, which made me start to look at the whole world a little different. And that's basically what's the first step. And then The Richest Man in Babylon truly changed my life too. It taught me about, you know, how to pay myself first before, um, just like, you know, you paying the government first every time you get paid. They're taking your money. You know, they're, they're taking your money for taxes. You don't see it, no matter if you have enough to pay your bills or not. Why Why you shouldn't pay yourself work? You know, before I pay any of my bills, before I give my money to MasterCard, before I give my money to, you know, Georgia Power, before I give my money to Geico, I need to pay myself first and, and do what I need to do with that money to make it grow. You know, and that's the only way you're going to um, get ahead out of it. Well, one more book I want to mention was... Um, Thank you, Grow Rich. Very powerful book. It just teaches you the, pretty much about the, the power of your mind and, um, you know, what you believe is, is what you achieve. You know what I'm saying? Um, if you believe you're a loser, you know, you're absolutely right. You're a loser. 
But if you believe that you're very rich and successful, then you're absolutely right. You're very rich and successful. It, it all starts with your mind frame. It's what you believe, what you will achieve. So in, in, in order to be a rich man, you have to have a rich mindset. Yeah, in so many words, you're absolutely right. Okay, so just to re reiterate, the three books is uh, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, and then the second book is um, The Richest Man in Babylon, and the third book is Think and Grow Rich. Yes, that is correct. Those are the three books that I actually read and changed my life. So, so, what, are, so what are some of the things that, that changed, such as a before and an after? Like if, if this was Adam back in, I don't know, uh, let's say Adam back in the year 2000, uh, what, what, what was he like compared to the Adam right now in 2003? Well, the Adam back in 2000, um, he, he enjoyed buying stuff. So I would have a whole bunch of expensive brand name clothes. I would be driving the best car I can afford. I would have bills that I just pay every month. And, you know, I would have, um, you know, whatever the pop most popular clothes are nowadays. Nowadays, you know, I can care less about that. Um, the rich buys assets and the poor buy stuff. I choose to buy assets with my money. The rich buys assets and the poor buy stuff. Yes. So you not buy assets? I buy assets. I buy... I buy, I put my money to work. I buy things that's going to make me more money. You buy or, if I'm not, or I buy something that's going to better myself, a program or some type of scrutiny that's going to help me develop my mind to make more money. You know, it, it's very important that you guard the door to your mind. So basically, you know, you need to change about what, what you hear, what's around you. You need to change everything so you can begin to think differently. It's not enough just reading it. Every morning when I wake up, the first thing I got to listen in the morning is some type of motivation, something positive. You must constantly feed your, your mind with positive um, stuff that's going to help you grow. Because when you go out to the world, I hate to say, but the world's full of negativity. So by just by default, you're going to be forced upon a whole bunch of negative stuff and, and negative people throughout your day. So you must have enough positive energy to be able to ignore that. And then instead of people influence you to think different, you will begin to influence other people to think better and different. Mm. You know, when, when, when we think about success and when we think about wealth, the first thing that comes to a lot of people's minds is money, money. And if you talk to people about money, what I realize is that some people, they kind of have this, um, this, this anti, uh, I don't know, just, just this, this, this dislike for money. Like, I don't want money to get away from me. I need just enough just to be happy. Like, I'm not worried about it. Um, Excuse me. What 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 are your views on uh, money and and what would you have to say to somebody who um, thinks like that? Somebody who thinks like that, I tell them you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. If they believe that they don't need money, that money's evil, then you're absolutely right. Money is evil for you. You don't need it. It's mm -hmm. just like I said a minute ago. It's it's whatever you believe. You know, whatever you believe is what you want in your life. You know, okay. this, this is your story. You you tell your own story. Whatever you tell your story. That's what it should be. Whatever you, know, you whatever you believe is what you want in life. Yeah. Whatever you believe that that's exactly what it will be. Okay. If you if you decide that you want more out of life, then you can easily have more out of life. You just gotta start with um thinking different. When you start thinking different, by default, you will start acting different and you will change the things that you do. And what one of the biggest things that I, I learned and it was very hard. I can't, this gets was kind of hard for me to do it first because it was just around me. Is that it's very important the people that you hang around. They have a very large influence in your life. If you hang around 10 losers, you will become the 11th loser. If you hang around 10 million years, you will become the 11th million year. So how, how, many, how many millionaires did you hang around with? Unfortunately, I don't hang around any millionaires. <laughs> you, you know, you know, I was uh, interviewing this um this homeless guy in Berkeley yesterday, and I put the video up sometime this week. Um, and I asked him what was his biggest regret, and he put his head down a little bit, and he was honest, and he said his biggest regret was he used to have an alcohol problem. See, he said he didn't have a drug problem, he he didn't have a jail problem, never went to jail, nothing like that, but he had an alcohol problem, and he said that. He's now hasn't drinking alcohol in 13 years. And I didn't ask him how he did it. He just told me. And he said what he did was he actually uh, got away from all the friends that uh, he, he used to hang around with. 
He said, because if you hang around those people and then they're going to drag you back to do it and you aren't going to be able to escape it. He said he didn't take any, any um, drugs, no therapy, you know, no nothing. He did it cold turkey. It was just by changing his environment. Yeah, uh, I agree. So, so, is, I, go ahead. so you're saying those same principles apply to when it comes to, to wealth, right? Or any transformation you want to do. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely right. It's like until um, something that I say to people, and if you're walking down the street with somebody, automatically, you know, nobody actually walks the same pace. But automatically, you're going to adjust to that person's pace or that person's going to adjust to your pace. It's just automatically just what happens. You know, so once you, when you're walking among in this world, who pace are you adjusting to? Mm. That's, that's up to you. That's powerful. Let me, let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, you know, per, personal questions so that people kind of get to know you uh, a little bit. Um, other than being my um, big little brother. Uh, so first question is, uh, what is your biggest regret in, uh, in life? Um, my biggest regret in life. Probably not. Um, I think one of my biggest regrets in life was um, smoking weed. Smoking weed? Yeah. Oh, what? Um, I, you know, I was, I think I was eight times the first time I smoked weed, and, you know, you, you, now you, you, that, you, you, hmm? Wait, eight? The first time you smoked no, weed? 18, 18, 18. 18. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, I, I, I look at it, I look back at my whole life, you know, it, it held me down. It, it really did help me down. It just, you know, I wasn't as motivated as I should have been. I was pretty lazy and, and laid back. I, I always had dreams and ambitions and stuff that I wanted in banks that should have been asked in life. But, you know, I was too busy just, you know, being high and hanging out with friends. So that's probably one of my biggest regrets in life. Mm, okay. And uh, what are some things in life that, that make you uh, happy? Um, just living. Waking up every day, being able to um, do what I do, growing. Um, thank, thank you, you know, thank you positive, meeting wonderful people hanging out with my son, you know, just living life. Life is great. You know, every day I wake up and I'm very thankful for life and I'm happy just to be alive, just to take another breath, you know? Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, what, what would you like the world to, to, to be like, uh, let's just say, uh, 10 years from now? What, um, is, what is your vision for, like, a better, a better world? But the world will be, um, you know, nobody has to actually go out and, and work like slaves. Man. You know, right now we're in the system where the government actually has everybody trained like, like they're the cream and, they're, and everybody else is a bunch of honeybees. And um, I, I would like the school system to be very different because right now the school system is very corrupt. It's, um, it trains uh, people are young to become two things, which is either an employee or a soldier, which is just terrible. Um, it, it really upset me when my son was only four years old in preschool. He came home telling me about all the different branches of government, um, of the military and what they do. I mean, why is my son learning at the age of four? You know what I'm saying? It's very important what we put into our um, young ones here, especially up to the age of seven. That's what most of them are going to be for, you know, pretty much the rest of their life, you know. And if we don't mold them into the right thing, it's going to be very hard for them to change. I mean, I, I did. I give thanks every day that I had the parents that you know I have, and that I was raised very different than other people. Right. So I believe that's one of the reasons I have not, you know, having it was easier for me to break out as a so-called matrix and see the world at a different place because I wasn't uh, um, uh, opposed um, to it at such a young age. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, All right. So, um, what do you what, what do you think about this whole Black Lives Matter movement and this the division that's happening in America with racism and the whole nine yards? Um, what do you think? Right. Well, my, my my main question is, what do you think it takes for uh, racism to end, or, or do you think it's possible for it to end? Um, ra racism. I'm very confident racism will end. It, it, I mean, slowly but surely, the reason being, if you pay attention to the younger generation, you know, 
like you went to a lot of these riots, there's a lot of white people out there protesting with us, protesting for us. It's the younger than the, um, generation that are truly friends with us and they don't have a prejudice bone in the body. But then you have this older generation that's still prejudiced and they're the ones who's trying to teach their kids and trying to keep this whole prejudice movement going on. But um, throughout time, I think we, we will grow away from it and that we will be able to live you know, in peace as one and we'll look at each other as equal. So it's, it's gonna take some time, it's gonna take a few generations but after some generations, you know what I'm saying, it will die out with each generation. How do we, how do we accelerate that process? What are some of the, the tools or systems that we can put in place to make sure that we're going in a forward direction? I mean, right now, I don't know if there's anything that we really can do to accelerate. Right now, I believe we are moving in the right direction. It's kind of like, um, it's just a snowball effect. You know what I'm saying? Right now, the snowball is, is, is slow. But as we get larger and larger, you know what I'm saying, there's going to be more and more um, people because the more and more generations will grow up and they'll have kids and not raise their kids to be precious. And those kids will have kids and not raise those kids to be precious. So it's just going to take time. It's going to take some generations for this to completely go away. How many more generations do you think, just off the top of your head? Nah, I don't know. I don't know, five. <laughs> five? Wow. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's interesting what you said because you said that, you know, doing the protesting, that there are a lot of white people who are side by side with black people and, and they're, you know, they're against it as well too, the racism and the dividing. You, I, I think back like in 1960s or whatever, looking at documents on TV, you know, people getting sprayed with water hoses and the whole uh, nine yards. There, there weren't that many white people protesting with black people back then. There were a couple, but they were, they, you know, not to the yeah. point where we see it um, right now. So, you know, it was the 60s, you know, that was one, two, that was like three, three generations ago, maybe two generations ago. It wasn't that long ago. Yeah. And, and it's getting better. It's, it not getting bad. Bad. it's not as bad as it was back then. Right. The same time, I mean, through, throughout time can heal anything. Right. So you just got to give it time. I mean, we're, we're heading towards the right direction. We just got to, you know, we need more, like these protesters, we don't need to, you know, act out in violence to show, you know, our anger, our concerns, there's other ways we can do it. So we just gotta keep doing the right thing, keep pushing forward, keep teaching our young runners the right thing so they can grow right and, and we will all be successful. Gotcha. All right, so final question. If you have one thing that you wanted to tell the people out there, um, just in terms of anything, uh, what what would that be? Um. If I have a, my message to everybody out there is to keep moving forward, to follow your dreams. Um, there's a lot of stuff that people believe that they can't have. They believe that, you know, because they wasn't born in some wealthy, you know, some wealthy family and they didn't have everything handed to them that other people just has things handed to them in a silver platter that they can't have the things they want in life. Um, my whole thing is, if you want something in life, um, you can have it. Anything's possible. Um, you seeing somebody else do it, that means you can do it. So you need just whatever dream you have, whatever your goal is, you got to just constantly study. You got to change your mind. And the main thing is you got to believe you can have it. And you just need to go out and get it. And if you do that, I guarantee you, you will achieve success. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, that's my um, advice to the world. And to never give up. That's one thing they teach you in school. Like in school, they teach you not to fail, which I think that's one of the biggest mistakes in school. They say, you know, you fail, you can't retake the test, that's the F. But a lot of people fail to realize that failing is one of the best teachers out there. There is no success without failure. Failing is a part of the process. You must fail over and over and over again. Never give up until you get it right. That's how you become successful. Mm. That's beautiful advice, man. I couldn't have said it better myself. Adam, I want to say thank you for coming on to the program. It's been a pleasure interviewing you. Maybe in the future, we can do it some other time. All right. Well, it was a pleasure speaking to you too, John. Thanks for having me. All right. All right.